uh, you're enrolled in the philosophy uh, department, you're enrolled in the school of P PPLS, philosophy, psychology and language sciences. And uh, that school is going to be the school if people refer to, uh, oh, talk to your school office or talk to your um, PG school office. That's what they mean, the school of PPLS. Um, because we are administratively hosting this program. Now, in terms of the content of the degree, it's joined between the School of Divinity and the Department of Philosophy. Um, we have lots of people from Divinity teaching on this program, as well as people from Philosophy. And we're trying to make this as interdisciplinary as possible. So um, that's really at the, at, the heart of this, at the heart of this program. Uh, it's an online only program. So uh, we know that there are a lot of online things happening now due to Corona. This is not true here. We've always been online. This has been conceived of and um, uh, and uh, done as an online program. And this is what we uh, really like about it uh, because it means that we are always attracting students from all over the globe. And uh, we're trying to build a sort of international community of people talking about these very big questions that we address in this program. So that's, that's what we're all about, if you like. Uh, in terms of who we are, um, you've already met a couple of us uh, in the welcome meeting, if you were able to join us for this. Um, so I'm Dr. Joe Wolf. I'm uh, in philosophy. I uh, am the program director, but I'm also teaching on this course and teaching one of the core modules, the first one, um, science, uh, philosophy, science and religion one, the physical world, which is running in the first semester. So if you're newly joining us here, um, in all likelihood, I will have told you already that you should be in that course. Um, I have a deputy program director in Divinity who would usually be here, but is on leave this semester. Uh, and she is, uh, this is Dr. Sarah Lane Ritchie, and she does theology and science and religion and science. And um, she's teaching a lot of the modules in semester two. So you'll meet her then, um, but for now, um, She's on leave, so this is why you have to contend with me for the time being. We have a number of core lecturers. I introduce a couple here. Um, Dr. Swilin Devel, who's teaching the new Phil Skills course, which is a two week zero credit course um, that you can do to um, learn about writing and reading philosophy, which a lot of students find quite helpful, especially since many of you will not have a philosophy background. This is in semester one. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mark Harris, who's uh, over in Divinity. He teaches science and scripture and uh, teaches that also in semester one. We have Dr. Trip Fuller, also in Divinity, teaching philosophy of religion. And we have Professor Michaela Massimi, teaching philosophy of science in semester two. So those are those are people who are who are lecturing on this program and you might encounter them as course organizers for various courses uh, in this uh, in this program. Now you might say, okay, that's all well and good, but how do I enroll, right? What is step one? How do, how do I get even onto these courses? Um, and this is, uh, can be a bit confusing, so I'll, I'll explain it. Um, course enrollment is not something that you do yourself. It's something that you do together with your personal tutor. This is why we're having these one-on-one -on -one meetings with personal tutors in uh, Welcome Week. Some of you have already met with me and some of you will have met with Martin already. Um, if you haven't, um, then you may have been scheduling a meeting for later this week. If you have not done that, please get in touch. Please make sure that you sign up for a meeting um, for your for your courses. So uh, once you've had your meeting with your personal tutor and discussed your course choices, then your enrollment in those courses will happen and you'll be officially matriculated. I know this can be confusing because you already registered, so you think you're already sort of halfway there. But again, these are steps that need to be taken. Now, once you're enrolled, you will have access to the course learn page. And as I said, I will be speaking about LEARN uh, in the second half of this presentation. Now, do be aware that especially during Welcome Week and in these early early days of the semester, it can take up to 48 hours before you actually get from I've spoken to my personal tutor to I have access to the LEARN page. That's just because both in terms of uh, human power and computational power, uh, we're sort of under a lot of uh, load right now because everybody's doing that. And so it can take a bit of time to process. It will happen. Now, once you're enrolled, fees will then start to send you an invoice about courses. If you're a full-time student, they'll bill you, I think, for the for the semester. If you're a part-time student, they bill you by course. I actually don't know very much about the fees process, so if you have questions about that, you can contact the PG office. But typically, they will just defer you to um, to uh, fees themselves because they are the ones who are doing the billing. So we are, we're not really involved in that process. 
So that's enrollment. And once once that's done, you're sort of set up and good to go. Now you might ask yourself, how many courses do I take? Right? Because um, that can be confusing because there are many different degrees that we're offering under the general he heading of uh, philosophy, science and religion. So for the MSc students, that are students pursuing the MSc in philosophy, science and religion, it's 120 credits of coursework, which works out to six credit bearing courses. So Phil Skills doesn't count, that's a zero credit course, but six credit bearing courses plus the dissertation, which is 60 credits. If you are uh, pursuing the diploma, the postgraduate diploma, then you also do 120 credits of coursework, which is again six courses, but you're not doing the dissertation. And if you're doing the certificate, then you're doing 60 uh, credits of coursework, which is three credit bearing courses. So it's quite straightforward, um, but those are the numbers of courses that you're that you're enrolling in. Now, obviously, if you're doing this part time, you're not going to be enrolling in those courses all at once, right? So if you're a part time student, typically you'll start with just one credit bearing course per semester to see how far that takes you. Um, you may want to up your course load in later semesters, but I usually recommend that you start with one just to see how that fits around your other commitments and um, how you're coping with the workload. OK, so what courses are you taking? Now we have um, a lot of courses on offer. Let me explain sort of what the various constraints on them are, because that can be quite confusing. It's, it is online, it is in our degree regulations, but I understand that those are not the most sort of immediately accessible um, documents to read. So the courses in bold here, Philosophy, Science and Religion 1, The Physical World, Philosophy, Science and Religion 2, Life and Mind, and Phil Skills are compulsory. So those are courses that you have to take. And indeed, we strongly recommend you take them in your first year if you're a part-time student. If you're a full-time student, obviously you're taking them in your first year. Those are in um, semester one, semester two, respectively. So philosophy, science and religion one is in semester one. Philosophy, science and religion two is in semester two. Now, there's not much choice about those, but there is a lot of choice about other courses you might take. We distinguish between what we call Group A courses and Group B courses. So on the uh, slide here, you'll see courses that are followed by an A. Uh, those are the Group A ones. And courses that are followed by a B, those are the Group B ones. The courses uh, in the light green are in semester one. The courses in the dark green are in semester two. Uh, why is this important? Well, we recommend that you don't take more than three credit bearing courses per semester, just because otherwise the workload is too much. And this is if you're a full time student. As I said, if you're a part time student, I recommend one course, possibly two if you feel comfortable. So but starting out with one is usually a good idea. OK, now what sorts of courses are on offer? Well, among the group A courses, philosophy of religion, science and scripture are available in semester one and philosophy of science, history of science and religion and mind meta spirit are available in semester two. You have to take two of those those courses. Uh, in, in, during your studies here. So you can choose of those five, you can choose two. Uh, you can choose more if you like, but you must take two of those. If you've taken your two courses uh, from that list and if you've, done, if you've done your compulsory courses, then there are other courses that you can optionally take. Those are the cursive ones in um, or the italic ones followed by B, the group B courses. And here you see the philosophy of mind and cognitive science, ethics and epistemology in the first semester in the regular version and then in the second semester in the advanced version. Please note that if you want to enroll in the advanced courses, you have to have taken the um, non-advanced course first. That makes sense, right? Uh, also, I'm really happy to see that this year we're able to offer Islamic philosophy in semester two, uh, which can be really exciting and uh, I think fits really nicely with uh, the core content of our program. So. I highly recommend um, looking at that course and uh, potentially enrolling in it in semester two. Now, this is a lot of information. Again, uh, you find all of that online. And um, you can also talk to your personal tutor in your one on one meeting about which courses you might want to choose. Now, when do courses start? Maybe you're already enrolled, maybe you're eager to get going. Um, the first week of class is September 21, so next Monday. Now, with an online program, it's not always so easy to know when a course has started. In fact, if you're enrolled in my course, you'll see that the course materials for week one are already up there. 
that's so that you can sort of try out the learn environment under real conditions. Uh, I'm not expecting you to have completed any assignments for this week because this is induction week. Uh, we're not expecting you to do um, actual schoolwork, as it were. So um, if you see that, don't don't worry about it. Officially, courses start in sept on September 21st. OK, what does it mean that courses start? How is teaching delivered on this course? It's online, right? Um, so all of the content of this course and everything we do is delivered online. What that means is that you'll have video lectures, which you can watch whenever you like. They will be made available um, in the relevant weeks. And um, you can download those most of the time, at least. I think for my course, you can download them and uh, watch them at your leisure, as it were. So whenever it fits into your own schedule. At least for my course, there are a couple of tasks associated with each lecture, which again are asynchronous. So I'm asking you to post something to the discussion board. Again, you do that when you have the time for it. When you're engaging with the lecture material, then you're engaging with those tasks. In addition to these um, asynchronous things like discussion boards and video lectures and online exercises, there are also live seminars. Now, the live seminars are synchronous teaching. So this is where people actually get together at the same time, just like we do now, and talk about what's been going on in the class, what's been going on in the readings, um, particular questions or topics that um, leap out as being particularly exciting. And uh, the schedule for those uh, will be found on Learn, again, because we're not done with enrollment yet. Those will be posted in week one, and you can sign up for live seminars there. They will be happening every other week. And for my course, at least, I'll be having two different um, sections for that because there's enough people in the course to have separate live seminars. But the content for those will be exactly the same. All right, so that's that's how teaching delivery works. As I said, we'll look at the exact details of the online learning environment um, in a bit, but that's that's how it goes. Uh, now, of course, one of the things that I think is the big advantage of this course and of this sort of program is that you're able to interact with students from other parts of the world, from very different cultural and religious and um, academic backgrounds. So that's really exciting. And we want to make sure that you make as much use of this as possible. So there are various ways in which you can interact online. One is obviously in the live seminars, but another more common way is to um, participate actively in the discussion boards. Um, most of the discussion boards are, of course, academic and talk about the content of the course, but they're also what we call coffee forums where you can just do off topic discussion to get to know your fellow students a bit more. So um, that's something that I encourage you to take advantage of because I think that's really something that makes this program quite unique. If you're in the dissertation stage, um, you'll also get one on one dissertation supervision. Again, also online. Um, people differ on which platforms they use. I've mostly been doing it through Teams now. Uh, I used to do it on Skype. Some people prefer Zoom, so there are different options. Um, you will have to sort that out with your supervisor when the time comes. But again, this is how it works, right? Online, regardless of where you are. So that's why it's a really nice, flexible program uh, to take advantage of. And obviously, particularly nice in times when you're perhaps not keen to leave the house. All right, now um, that's how teaching works. Many of you will have questions about assessment and marking, so I'll say a little bit about this here, although obviously your course organizer will be the main point of contact for assessment for your particular course. Now, for all the courses in this program, the main piece of assessment you're writing is a course essay that will count for 85% of your mark. And that's usually due at the end of the semester. So for philosophy courses for semester one, this will be December 15th. That deadline, and I should emphasize these are hard deadlines in the UK. So um, when your course organizer says this is the deadline, then that's the deadline. There's no negotiation, there's no extension. If you need extra time because you've been ill or because you've had some sort of family emergency, uh, you need to apply for what is called special circumstances, right? And that's sort of a formal process that doesn't actually go through your course organizer directly. And your personal tutor and uh, the PG office will be able to help you figure out how that works. But please be aware that if you need an extension, it's not a matter of just asking your course organizer. Your course organizer can't do anything about these deadlines. Okay, so having said that, um, 
most people do manage to write their essays in time and that's not a big deal at all. Now, the other component of assessment for your courses is participation, and that's 15% of your mark, and that is different across different courses. So all courses have essays, but then how participation is assessed is different. So you will have to check your course guide and talk to your course organizer about how participation works for their particular class. Now the marking in the UK is again, it's a very serious business. Um, it's anonymous where possible and it's moderated. So your course organizer will be marking, but then there'll be other academics involved in checking those marks and making sure that they're consistent. Uh, and they will have to be approved by an exam board. So what that means is that uh, once you've handed in an essay, it can be quite a while before you get a mark on it because you initially only get provisional marks back and then the official mark is something that the exam board needs to ratify. And that can be, again, if you're not familiar with the UK system, that can be a bit odd and weird, but please, um, your course organizers, again, can't do anything about that. That's part of the system here, not sort of their doing. The program handbook, uh, which is uh, available on the hub, is something where you see a lot of the details of that as well. So, um, so please check out the, the program handbook for details on assessment and marking and how that works in the UK. Uh, finally, as the sort of last point on the, on the program itself, let me talk a bit about the dissertation. The dissertation, if you are an MSc student, is 8,000 words and it's worth 60 credits. Crucially, it involves independent research on a topic of your choice. Although I should say it needs to be approved by the program director um, or the program director and the deputy director, because we need to make sure that it's feasible and that we have supervision capacity for that pro uh, for that project. You have three months of writing only for the dissertation. That doesn't mean that you should start thinking about your dissertation at the beginning of those three months. You should start thinking about the dissertation long ahead of that but you'll be writing your dissertation in those three months. And during those three months, you will have supervision by one of the academics at Edinburgh. As I said, online supervision. If you're a part-time student, uh, it's flexible when you, when you have that dissertation period. You can have it, for example, from uh, September through November or from uh, February to April, or you can do it in the summer, which is what full-time students do, which is from, um, uh, June through August. So dissertation periods vary for part-time students. For the full-time students, they're always in the summer. Now one thing, because this is, an, this is an interdisciplinary program, one question that often comes up is, oh, does my dissertation have to cover everything? Philosophy, science, religion? Um, no, right? The dissertation is 8,000 words, so it's not going to cover all of these areas. Instead, it's going to be a very narrow, very specific topic and um, it will typically fall into either sort of more philosophical um, area or it will fall into sort of science and religion. Maybe there's some kind of overlap. I mean, obviously, if you're doing a philosophy of religion uh, dissertation, then that's going to involve both religion and philosophy. Um, if you're doing philosophy of science, then it's going to involve both philosophy and science. So those sorts of things um, do happen, but be aware that your topic is going to be much narrower than sort of the, the interdisciplinary nature of this program suggests. And um, we're, we're not expecting you to cover sort of both methodologically or in terms of the content, all the things that we do in this program. That would be uh, asking far too much and would not be a feasible project. So uh, a narrow, um, well-defined question is usually what we're looking for for the dissertation. Okay, now that's a ways off for all of you. So I will uh, not say much more about that now and instead open up for questions about the program. Please raise your hands if you have questions. Eric, you have a question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it, it, so is are all the part time students being enrolled then in uh, besides your course also in Phil skills in this first semester? 
yes, typically. If you have, if you think there are good reasons why you don't need it, um, you can get in touch with me as program director. Um, but typically, yeah, you'd be enrolled in that. But it's a two-week course, so it's not very onerous at all. I see. Thank you. All right. Any any more questions on this? Have I actually succeeded in answering all of your questions? That would be very surprising. Well, all right. Um, in that case, I will move on to the online learning environment and talk you up. Oh, Damit, you have a question. Excellent. Hi, Joe. Sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, thank you. I was just purely curious as to how many students are enrolled and in which countries they reside. And I'm wondering if I'm the only Antipodean. OK, um, good. So uh, that's a, that's a very good question. And um, so the overall program is, is quite large. And the first year, I think we have about 30 students starting right now with us. Um, if you go to the hub, I will say a bit more about the hub in a moment. Um, if you go to the hub, you'll find a discussion board where you can introduce yourself. And one of the things people talk about is where they're from. So you'll see um, where people are from and um, you'll you'll find uh, well, either, either people who are from your part of the world or you'll find that everybody else is from all over the world. Um, so that's that's one of the fun things about this. Um, so I recommend you check out the hub and introduce yourself there and see what everybody else has to say about who they are and where they're from. Thank you. OK. Yep, uh, Tom. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Yep. OK, perfect. Um, so you mentioned that the writing of the dissertation is limited to a three month period. Um, and the way it looked on the website, it, it appeared that that was a an entire year was dedicated to that. So I'm, I'm a little confused. Like how long is the actual work done for the dissertation portion? Good. So you're enrolled in the dissertation for an entire year. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And I certainly recommend that you start thinking about the dissertation well in advance of that three month period. The three month period is sort of the writing period. That's where there's no coursework that you're taking. There's nothing else that's going on. You're just doing the dissertation. That's that three month period. OK, thank you very much. I appreciate that. OK. Eric, another question. Oh, sorry about that. Looks like I was talking to a muted mic. Um, just to follow up on Tom's question, because I I had the same confusion about that. It, is it possible? And I know that we need to get approval for, uh, understandably. It, would it be possible to um, open up that discussion uh, regarding approval and topics before that three month period? Say we want to set aside six months or something like that. All right, good. So clearly, clearly, I should have said a bit more about this. So um, for your for full time students, and I'm going to talk about part time students in a moment, but for full time students, your dissertation proposal is going to be due in February 2021. Right. So midway through semester two, basically. And um, before that, I will be in touch with you, but you should also feel free to get in touch with me at any time about this. I will be in touch asking you whether you've started to think about what your dissertation might be on, um, whether you've started to think about potential supervisors, and uh, they're sort of, think, think of it this way, after you've done your first semester, you should start thinking about what your dissertation might be, and uh, you should start reading on that. You should think about who your supervisor might be and possibly get in touch with them and work on your dissertation proposal. That will be due midway through your semester two, and once that's turned in, then it goes through the approval process. And if you've been in touch with people, if it's well worked out, there's usually not a problem with approving it. The problems with approval show up when people haven't been in touch, have projects that are way too big, or 
uh, have projects that we don't have supervision for, right? So if you want to write on a topic that we just don't have any specialists working in, then that might be a problem. So if you've uh, done your homework, as it were, and um, we've been communicating well in semester two already, long before the proposal is due, there's usually not a problem with it. So the three month period that I'm talking about, the sort of June through August um, period is really something where we're expecting that you'll be focused significantly on your dissertation, right? So you're not trying to do all kinds of other things at the same time. And at the same time, we're providing you with supervision during that period that will be uh, dedicated to your project. So um, that's that's a three month period. But you're absolutely right. You obviously will have been thinking about your dissertation long before that, and you will have um, been in touch with people about possible supervision arrangements. You will have been um, reading relevant literature on it, and you will certainly have formulated your dissertation proposal well in advance. Sorry, I hope I hope that that helps a bit with the um, with the background on this. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, maybe I'll move on to the um, online and learning environment just so you see what that looks like and you'll have sort of a head start on sorting out um, where to find things. And then uh, there'll be time for more questions at the end of the session. So as I said, all teaching delivery is online. So you might ask yourself, what, what is that going to look like? Now, the most important place to go for this is what we call Learn, which is a platform for virtual learning. And uh, you have two ways of accessing it. Either you can get through it directly, uh, learn.ed.ac.uk, or you go through it um, by logging into the MyEd portal, which is where you find your email. There's also a tab, I don't know exactly what it looks like for you, but there's also a tab that will allow you to access Learn from there. And whichever way you go, uh, Learn is going to be your main source of content, your main source of, of classes. There are several things that you find on Learn. Um, there are two hubs now. One hub is the um, PPLS Postgraduate Hub, which has information for all postgraduate students in PPLS. So that's it's nice to have, but it's not where you find the most relevant information for your uh, program. For your program, go to the PSR hub, which is the philosophy, science and religion hub, which is sort of our um, central place for this program. There you have information and in exchange for all PSR students. So both your cohort and any previous cohorts um, that are still around because they're part time students. And uh, there you'll find, for example, the discussion board I mentioned. Um, where you can introduce yourself, where you can see where other people are coming from. And you also find a ton of information about the program itself and um, things that you can try out to get used to the, um, the online learning environment. So um, one assignment for this week, if there is one, is go to the PSR hub and sort of introduce yourself and work your way around there, try things out, explore. And then of course, the, your individual course pages, which is where most of your learning takes place. And um, th those contain, contain information about your co course, course materials, that is lectures, um, uh, readings and such things, course activities like discussion boards, live seminars, and submission of assessed work. This is where you submit your essays as well. So all of that happens uh, on Learn and typically happens in your individual course pages. Now, an individual course page might look something like this. This is, uh, this is the hub. Um, the hub uh, has a sort of main window and then it has a sidebar here and a lot of the action is in the sidebar. So I'll explain a bit more about what the sidebar looks like. So here's our PSR hub. Um, here's the sidebar. There you have announcements, program wide announcements. So if you know the dissertation proposals are due, uh, Becky or I will send out an announcement and say your dissertation proposals are due. Um, for induction week, you'll find there are a bunch of activities and information here. So if you haven't checked this out, if you haven't seen the hub, please go there and um, look at your induction activities. There's also program information. And here I particularly want to stress the handbook. The program handbook is really the authoritative source of information. Uh, the promise, of course, with, with uh, online information, a lot of it is duplicated. Uh, inevitably, inevitably, there will be some place where it's out of date. 
no matter how many people are working on this and try to keep it up to date. So if you really want to be sure about some issue or other about the program, please take a look at the program handbook. It's massive. There's ton a ton of information in there, um, but that's really uh, where you can have a sense of this. This is this is how it works. Um, if there are any uncertainties about this. You also find uh, the meet the teams, um, meet the team uh, tab here, which will give you again a bit of information about the people involved in this program, including not just the course organizers, but also various um, people who support your learning, like our learning technologists, like our academic librarian, and of course the PPLS PG office, who's immensely helpful and um, solves a lot of problems as they arise. So, um, so those um, those are people that you should know about. And finally, I just want to point out, I mean, again, as I said, you should check all of this out, but one thing that you might sort of miss, perhaps, is around the program. And that is a collection of research talks in philosophy and in science and religion that have happened at Edinburgh over the years that have been recorded and that you're able to watch there, which is good because um, usually uh, if we have on campus students, of course, uh, they would be coming to these seminars and sit in the in the discussion. Um, but you're able to uh, sort of look at an entire history, an entire catalogue of um, research, research talks that have been given here. And um, not all of them are immediately related to the content of this programme, but obviously a lot of them are, and I think they're exciting in any case. So um, please have a look at those and, um, and uh, feel free to, um, to watch. OK, so that's the hub. That was not what I intended to do. Um, further down on the hub, you find the virtual classroom, uh, which you can use uh, to video meet other students. So obviously our live seminars take place in a virtual classroom, but you can also start sessions there and meet students. So if you find, oh, there are a couple of people in my time zone and we really like to, you know, have a bit more of a chat about this particular reading or, you know, grab a coffee together and, uh, and talk about our lives and interests and whatnot do use the live common room if you like, right? if it's available, obviously. Um, I think that tool is sometimes not made use of, but I, I strongly encourage you to do that. And indeed, there's the discussion board, which is where you can introduce yourself and um, you can also ask general questions about the program or about technology if you're struggling with particular, um, particular uh, tech issues. And of course, you can again chat informally with your peers. I mentioned this time and again because I think online learning can be perceived as being a bit lonely because you're sort of sitting in front of your computer, but that's not entirely true, right? You're sitting in front of your computer, but then somewhere else in the world, somebody else is sitting in front of their computer trying to wrestle with the same sort of content and problems, and they might be quite keen to chat with you about it. So again, use that and um, and see who's there and uh, um, start discussions with people there. It, it's really quite nice. Uh, there's also a ton of information about the dissertation. I'm not going to go into this in any detail. Uh, we've already seen uh, that the structure, um, uh, uh, what, the, what the structure of the dissertation might be like. But here you find uh, useful things like the proposal form. You know, there's a formal um, form that you use to submit your proposal. You find it there. You find the deadlines. You find a lot of stuff on plagiarism and how to avoid it. Uh, you find examples of dissertations, you find videos with student experiences about writing the dissertation. So if this is something you're already beginning to think about or as you're starting to think about it, I recommend look at those resources and um, make yourself familiar with them because again, it can be quite helpful to see what's available and um, how to go about the dissertation. Okay, so that's that's the PSR hub. And that's, as I said, that's sort of the central all PSR um, online place. Now that they're uh, now, of course, they're the individual course pages, which is where your classes take place. And um, those again have a sort of similar general outline to to the hub, so it's easy to get confused, um, but they have different content. Again, I'll focus on the sidebar because that's where a lot of the action is. So here, and this is from my course, um, obviously, uh, here you'll have um, a bunch of uh, sort of structure on the sidebar and this might vary from course to course a little bit. So one thing that you'll have is course information. This contains the course guide and in my case a little video in addition to the course guide. The course guide is what you might call a syllabus in the United States. 
it contains sort of the, the topics for the course, the readings for the course, um, information about things like office hours, uh, assessment information, all of that sort of stuff. And it contains a link to the degree regulations and program tables, uh, which is sort of the official DRPS is the, the thing that we call it, uh, where you find your course options that you might enroll in and uh, the regulations that govern your degree. So that's that's course information. And obviously, um, once you've access to the learn page, please go there and have a look at the course guide that will tell you what's going to happen in the course. Uh, you have course materials. Um, those are organized by week and they contain the lecture videos and uh, several things to do each week. So for my course, what I like to do is I like to have a couple of short tasks, um, bo both before and during the lecture. Uh, that will help you stay engaged with the material and allow you to interact with other students. And uh, so that's just in addition to just watching the lecture. And I should say for my course, those will usually be released on Sunday. So um, for this week, because the first week I've put everything up there and you can just look at it now. But typically uh, the Sunday before the week um, starts is when those materials will be available. And that's in part to um, keep it less cluttered so you know what's on for, for a given week. But also because I think there's a temptation for online courses to skip ahead to the things that you're especially interested in or to binge on content and neither of those are actually pedagogically very useful. So I'll pace you by releasing those adaptively. Um, then the course material, uh, then the course activities, and this is where you find discussion boards, both a lecture discussion board, which is a sort of entire class discussion board where you talk about the lecture and where I sort of structured the discussion board in various ways and tutorial discussion boards where you divide it into groups and you can start your own threads and that's sort of more student led discussion. Uh, you also find what is called a journal, which I sometimes use to ask you to provide short sort of writing assignments, reflections on lecture content, and that's private between you and me. So that's not something your, your fellow students see, unlike the discussion board and the virtual classroom, which is where our live seminars will take place. So all of those are under course activities. And again, this week is a good time to just click through those. Learn is sometimes sort of very click intensive. You have to click through several things before you get to it. But if you persist, you'll end up with a, a sort of nice set of useful things that you can do and um, try them out this week. Then the library resources. Um, this is where you access the class readings. As I said, we strive to make our readings available online as much as we can. I believe that all the essential readings and most of the additional readings are available online, um, but if not, do let me know or do let our uh, librarian know and they'll, they'll help you find them. And those are available um, throughout, so those are, those are globally available. So they're not released by week, so if you want to read ahead, that's something you can always do. Um, but be aware that you may have to be logged in or you may have to log in again because the University of Edinburgh is very concerned about uh, making sure that only legitimate users have access to resources. So sometimes to access a resource, you may have to log in a couple of times. That's annoying, but um, again, fear not. Uh, it usually works. It just takes a little while. OK, finally, assessment, um, assessment information and submission. That's all there. So for um, this course, you'd be submitting your assignments, uh, your assessments there. And um, that's true for both the formative essay, which is the optional ungraded essay where you get feedback on it, but it doesn't count towards your final mark. And it's true for the final essay, which is um, which is what which is actually marked and which will count to 85% of your mark for the course. So those are all there. Um, we use Turnitin as a plagiarism check. So obviously don't plagiarize, but um, be aware that we're also checking for that. Uh, Finally, down here, this is not course specific, the general student resources that you might want to um, use and, uh, and participate in if you like, uh, but that's not specific to any particular course or indeed to the PSR program. Okay, so that's what you find on Learn. And um, again, I suggest this week, don't even worry too much about the content of the co course. Initially, just get yourself familiar with, um, with how Learn works and what you can do in various places. And do make sure that you um, chat with your with your peers and um, sort of get to know who you are and, and who they are and um, how the learning environment works. All right. 
Now the course activities um, will vary by course. In my course, as I said, there's a lecture board and a discussion and a tutorial discussion board. Some courses will only have a single discussion board. Uh, there's a virtual classroom and there's the personal journal. So um, that's sort of what happens when you open course activities. And you can uh, you can have a look at those and um, you'll find there's some entries there already. The discussion boards, uh, let me stress one thing about them. Uh, up here, so this is what will look like if you open the lecture discussion board. Up here, it says discussion board participation and assessment. Please have a look here before posting. I mean that, please have a look there before posting. It will explain various things about how the discussion boards work, how they're structured, and what sorts of things make for good discussion board posts. So please have a look at that and um, use that to think about your own posts as well, because the discussion board is meant to be a sort of community forum where you can exchange ideas and the better we handle that, the more fruitful that exchange is going to be. So have a look at that before you post. Um, you also find course logistics and course content as forums where you can post general questions about the course. So the course logistics, obviously the course guide and the program handbook will help, but I'm sure the logistical questions that will come up that aren't covered there. So you can post them there and that would be helpful because then we can all see them and I can answer them once for everyone as opposed to trying to answer individual emails, which tends to be less helpful. Course content, similarly, if you have questions about the course content that doesn't really fit into a particular week, maybe you have a sort of global question or you have a question about something that wasn't covered in any given week, this is a good place to, to ask these course content. Um, if you have a question about a particular week, then um, please post those in the forum for the particular week. For each week, there'll be a questions about the lecture thread in the forum um, where you can ask questions about the lecture. So I really use the discussion board very much to um, have an ongoing conversation about the course, about the content of our class. And again, I encourage you to all participate in that. And I see here um, that there are quite a few of you who have participated already, so great job. Now, that was LEARN. As I said, LEARN is your main virtual environment and there's lots of material there. Um, here are a couple of other useful websites that you might uh, need to refer back to. Uh, here's the DRPS, um, which is your degree regulations and the course choices that you have. Then there's, of course, the PPLS website, the Divinity website. Since both of those schools are involved in teaching uh, this on this program, it's worth having a look, especially if you're getting to the point of looking for supervisors. And then there's the library catalog, which is quite helpful because even if there, even if the resources for particular courses are available uh, through the resource list, you may want to look for particular readings on your own because you're pursuing an essay topic or because uh, you're thinking about your dissertation. So using the library that you have access to as a student of the Un University of Edinburgh is a very good idea. And we do have, at least as far as articles are concerned, a very large online collection. And increasingly, we also have a lot of eBooks so uh, you'll be able to access those resources and use them in your writing. So I encourage you to have a look at these things. OK, so that was again a lot from me. Um, questions about learn, questions about. Uh, about the, um, the resources that are available to you. So Eric, is that a new hand or an old hand? old hand, okay. Elizabeth. Is your mic still muted? No. We can't hear you. Elizabeth? If your mic's not working, maybe type the question to the chat. Right, okay. Um, yeah, so as I said, if you've selected your courses, um, 
it may take a moment for them to show up. Although, um, yeah, so so that that may take a moment um, for them for them to show up. Although I do believe we still have our meeting outstanding, don't we? So you need to meet with me before you can enroll. Yeah, so that's that's what I thought. So um, so when you when you when you meet with me on Friday, um, we'll we'll do the enrollment. It won't work before then. Okay, more questions. That was a lot of information, wasn't it? You're ready for your first coffee today or second coffee. Another chat question. Um, so I'm such an understand how I am Oh my gosh. Sorry, I don't know who's back on with you. I was gonna jump at the Okay, I think that was John. Um all right. Uh yes, Yevgeny, you have a question. Yeah, hi. Um I have a question related to, to your course. It is written there that um, fifteen percent of uh, the total grade will be assessed through the quizzes. Could you explain a little bit more what does it mean and how how it would be actually working? Okay. Yeah. So uh, there are three quizzes, uh, each of them worth five percent of your mark, and those quizzes will happen uh, every three to four weeks, in I think week three, seven, and eleven, and they're cumulative in the very minimal sense that um, it will cover material from the sort of three to four preceding weeks. Um, that's what's going to happen in each quiz. They're going to be, again, they're going to be on learn and they'll be extremely straightforward. They will not, uh, so there'll be multiple choice or similar types of, um, of quizzes where you um, go through a couple of online questions and then you'll immediately get a result. So. Um, nothing, nothing particularly fancy or particularly difficult here. Uh, really, just a way to check that you're actually watching the lecture and um, and keeping up with the course. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, John, you have a question. I'm unmuting you now. Hopefully, uh, not quite. Hi, can you hear me now, Joe? Yes, I can hear you now. Perfect. Yeah, no worries. So doing the uh, part time philosophy, science and religion masters, is it compulsory for uh, the first year and semester one and two to do those two fundamental courses? So if PSR one and PSR two spread across the two semesters or can you mix it up and do one in the first semester and then perhaps philosophy of science in the second semester and then later on do the, uh, the second uh, compulsory course, if you like? So that's a very good question. It is not strictly compulsory. It is strongly recommended. So okay. yeah. if if you say if, if you have very good independent reasons for why you absolutely want to do philosophy of science in that term, um, then you can do that technically. Uh, although again, in conversation with your personal tutor, every personal tutor will say, oh, we encourage you to do um, those courses first. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, excuse me, I have one more question related to, uh, to the Learning Hub. Uh, there okay. is a section called My Groups, uh, where I and I see their um, tutorial group number three. What does it actually mean? Ah, your tutorial groups. Excellent. Um, so uh, for this course, I'm using tutorial groups as a way of having discussion board discussions in a slightly smaller setting. So you'll have your dis tutorial discussion board will always involve the same group of people um, and there's fewer of you so that if you want to have more extended discussions, the reading as it were is still manageable. The, a discussion board with um, over 20 people 
becomes unmanageable very quickly if people actually want to get deep into particular issues and it becomes sort of difficult to follow up on. Whereas if you have a smaller group of people, um, that works much better. So the way to think about it is to think the lecture discussion board is, this is what would happen if you go into your lecture theater and um, you have some discussions with, with fellow students there. Um, the tutorial discussion board is what happens if you go into your tutorial room and you have your discussions with your fellow students there, so a smaller number of people, and you can start your own threads. Now, the live seminars are utterly distinct from that. So the people in your tutorial group and the people who happen to be in the live seminar you're in may be completely different. So they're not linked at all. So this is why I call them tutorials, um, to distinguish them from the seminars, to distinguish them from the lecture. OK, got it. Thank you. OK. All right. OK, I realized this was a lot of information. Um, you may need some time to digest this. Uh, many of you will still have meetings uh, with your personal tutor coming up this week. If you've already had your meeting with your personal tutor and you're already enrolled, please explore, uh, learn as much as you can. Um, if you're still enrolling, that's fine. Don't worry. Um, you'll have time to explore um, after that. And uh, if there are any more questions, please get in touch with me. Again, if you like, post them on the discussion board. And um, I hope I'll see many of you in PSR1 in the semester. Thank you very much. Thank you.